Let's continue to read the book, The Psychology of Money, Chapter Ten. Save money. The only factor you can control generates one of the only things that matters. How wonderful! Let me convince you to save money. It won't take long, but、uh, it's an old task, isn't it? Do people need to be convinced to save money? My observation is that yes, many do. Past a certain level of income, people fall into three groups: those who save, those who don't think they can save, and those、uh, who don't think they need to save. This is for the latter two. The first idea, simple, but easy to overlook, is that、uh, building wealth has little to do with、uh, your income or investment returns, and lots to do with、uh, your saving rate. A quick story about the power of、uh, efficiency. In the nineteen seventies, the world looked like、uh, it was running out of oil. The calculation wasn't hard. The global economy used a lot of oil. The global economy was growing, and the amount of oil we could drill couldn't keep up. We didn't run out of oil, thank goodness. But、uh, that wasn't just because we found more oil, or even got better at taking it up to the ground. The biggest reason we overcame the oil crisis. Is because we started building cars, factories, and homes that are more energy efficient than they used to be. The United States used sixty percent less energy per dollar of GDP today than it did in nineteen fifties. The average miles per gallon of all vehicles on the road has doubled since nineteen seventy five. A nineteen eighty nine Ford Taurus sedan. Averaged eighteen mpg miles per gallon. A twenty nineteen Chevy Suburban, absurdly large SUV, averaged eighteen point one mpg. The、um, world grew its energy wealth not by increasing the energy it had, but by decreasing the energy it needed. U.S. oil and gas production has increased sixty-five percent since nineteen seventy-five, while conservation and efficiency has more than doubled. What we can do with that energy, so it's easy to see which has mattered more. The important thing here is that finding more energy is largely out of our control and shrouded in uncertainty. Because it relies on a slippery mix of having the right geology, geography, weather, and geopolitics, but becoming more efficient with the energy we use is largely in our control. The decision to buy a lighter car or ride a bike is up to you and has a one hundred percent chance of improving efficiency. The same is true with our money. Investment returns can make you rich, but whether an investing strategy will work, and how long it will work for, and whether markets will cooperate, is always in doubt. Results are shrouded in uncertainty. Personal savings and frugality, finances, conservation, and efficiency, are parts of the money equation that are more in your control. And have a one hundred percent chance of being as effective in the future as they are today. If you will building wealth as something that will requires more money or big investment returns, you may become a pessimistic as the energy doomers were in the nineteen seventies. The path forward looks hard and out of your control. If you view it as is. Powered by your own frugality and efficiency, the destiny is、uh, clearer. Wealth is just the accumulated、uh, leftovers after you spend what you take in, and since you can build wealth without a high income, but 
have no chance of building wealth without a high savings rate. It's clear which one matters. More importantly, the value of wealth is relative to what you need. Say you and I have the same net worth, and say you are a better investor than me. I can earn eight percent annual returns, and you can earn twelve percent annual returns. But I'm more efficient with my money. Let's say I need half as much money to be happy. Well, your lifestyle compounds as fast as your assets. I'm better off than you are. Despite being a worse investor, I'm getting more benefit from my investments. Despite lower returns, the same is true for incomes. Learning to be happy with less money creates a gap between what you have and what you want, similar to the gap you get from growing your paycheck, but easier and more in your control. A high savings rate means、uh, having lower expenses than you otherwise could, and having lower expenses means your savings go farther than they would if you spend more. Think about this in the context of how much time and effort goes into achieving 0.1 percent of annual investment after performance, millions of hours of research, tens of. Billions of dollars of effort from、uh, professionals, and it is easy to see what's potentially more important or worth chasing. There are professional investors who grind eighty hours a week to add a tenth of a percentage point to their returns. When there are two or three full percentage points of a lifestyle bloat in. Their finances that can be exploited with less effort, big investment returns and fat sec、uh, paychecks are amazing when they can be achieved, and some can achieve them. But the fact that、uh, there is so much effort put into one side of our finance equations, and so little put into the other, is an opportunity for most people. Past a certain level of income, what you need is just what sits below your ego. Everyone needs the basics. Once they are covered, there is another level of comfortable basics. And past that, there are basics that are both comfortable, entertaining, and entertain enlightening. But spending beyond a pretty low level of、uh, materialism is mostly a reflection of、uh, ego approaching income, a way to spend money to show people that you have or had money. Think of it like this: and one of the most powerful ways to increase your savings isn't to raise your income; it's to raise your humility. One. You define savings as the gap between your ego and your income. You realize why many people with decent incomes save so little. It's a, a daily struggle against instincts to extend your peacock feathers to their utmost limits and keep up with、uh, others doing the same. People with、uh, enduring personal finance success, not necessarily those with high incomes, tend to have a, a propensity to not give a damn what others think about them. So people's ability to save is more in their control than they might think. Savings can be created by spending less. You can spend less if you desire less. And、uh, you will desire less if you care less about、uh, what others think of you. As I argue often in this book, money relies more on psychology than finance, and you don't need a specific reason to save. Some people save money for a down payment on a house, or a new car, or for retirement. That's great, of course. But saving does not require a goal of purchasing something specific. You can save just for savings' sake, and indeed you should. 
everyone should. Only saving for a specific goal makes sense in a predictable world, but ours isn't. Saving is a hedge against life's inevitable ability to surprise the hell out of you at the worst possible moment. Another benefit of a savings that、uh, isn't attached to a spending goal is what we discussed in Chapter Seven: gaining control over your time. Everyone knows the tangible stuff money buys. The intangible stuff is harder to wrap your head around, so it tends to go unnoticed. But the intangible benefits of money can be far more valuable and capable of increasing your happiness than the tangible things that are obvious targets of our savings. Savings without a spending goal gives you options and flexibility. The ability to wait and the opportunity to pause. It gives you time to think. It lets you change course on your own terms. Every bit of、uh, savings is like、uh, taking a point in the future that would have been owned by someone else and giving it back to yourself. That flexibility and control over your time is a.、Uh, Uh, unseen return on wealth. What is the return on cash in the bank that gives you the option of changing careers, or retiring early, or freedom from、uh, worry? I would say it's incalculable. It's incalculable in two ways. It is so large and important that we cannot put a, a price on it. But、uh, it's also literally. Incalculable, we cannot measure it like we can measure interest rates, and、uh, what we cannot measure, we tend to overlook. When you don't have a control over your time, you are forced to accept whatever bad luck is thrown your way. But if you have a flexibility, you have the time to wait for no-brainer opportunities to fall in your lap. This is a, a hidden return on your savings. Savings in a bank that earn zero percent interest might actually generate a extraordinarily large return if they give you the flexibility to take a job with a lower salary but more purpose, or wait for investment opportunities that come. When those without flexibility turn desperate, and that、uh, hidden return is、uh, becoming more important. The world used to be hyper local. Just over one hundred years ago, seventy-five percent of、uh, Americans have、uh, neither telephones nor regular mail service, according to historian Robert Coden. That made a、uh, competition hyper local. A worker with just average intelligence might be the best in their town, and they got treated like the best because they didn't have to compete with the smarter worker in another town. That's、uh, now changed. A hyper-connected world means that a talent pool you compete in has、uh, gone from hundreds or thousands. Spending your time to millions or billions, spanning the globe. This is especially true for jobs that rely on working with your head versus your muscles. Teaching, marketing, analysis, consulting, accounting, programming, journalism, and even medicine increasingly compete in global talent pools. More fields will fall into this category as a digital. Globalization、uh, erases global boundaries as、uh, software eats the world, as venture capitalist、uh, Mark Anderson puts it. A question you should ask, as the range of your competition expands, is、uh, how do I stand out? I'm smart is increasingly a bad answer to that question. Because、uh, there are a lot of smart people in the world, almost six hundred people 
ace the SATs each year. Another seven thousand come within a handful of points. In a winner take all and globalized world, these kinds of people are increasingly your direct competitors. Intelligence is not a reliable advantage in a world that's becoming as connected as ours has, but the flexibility is. In a world where intelligence is hyper competitive, and many previous technical skills have become automated, competitive advantages tilt toward nuanced and soft skills like communication. Empathy and perhaps most of all, flexibility. If you have flexibility, you can wait for good opportunities, both in your career and for your investments. You will have a a better chance of being able to learn a new skill when it's necessary. You will feel less urgency to chase competitors who can do things you can't. And have a more leeway to find your passion and your niche at your own pace. You can find a new routine, a slower pace, and、uh, think about life with a different set of、uh, assumptions. The ability to do those things when most others can't is one of the few things that、uh, will set you apart in a world where intelligence is no longer a sustainable advantage. Having more control over your time and options is becoming one of the most valuable currencies in the world. That's why more people can and more people should save money. You know what else they should do? Stop trying to be so rational. Let me tell you why. That's the end of this section. We will know why in the next chapter.